he full well knows that a lot of what he does is to sell his products. And I mean, he always sticks in the product advertisement on the end of what he does now, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Buy, I buy this new, this, that, and the other. So he's got a vested interest in keeping up appearances. So I don't know. I'm not 100% certain. I'm, I, I think a lot of these people might have started off believing what they believed and then kind of, it doesn't matter anymore now because they're doing so well with it. And hello everyone, welcome back to Trolley World Logic. I know you didn't expect to hear back from us so soon, and yes, this show is pre-recorded. Um, I'll go quickly into the reasons we're back, mainly we did an interview a few weeks, I did an interview a few months ago with the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, and I just found out the other day that they've published said interview, and so we just thought, yeah, we better do something. And also, the show is going to be changed up a little, as you can already have see we doing all this pre-recorded and yeah so i think the first big change is uh, like i say i won't be around to host all the time college is just demanding too much of my time but i will be here to help out as much as i can and so it'll give me great pleasure to kind of do this sort of handing of the mic ceremony over to a person you're quite familiar with you're, you're still fairly new to the show but I think everyone can see. I think the the mic's going to be in good hands. Nathan, here you go. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, this is trolling with logic for October thirtieth, two thousand sixteen. Welcome to the show, everybody. Yeah, uh, it's good to be here. And uh, as I say now, Nathan, you've got the dubious. I don't know if it's a burden or an honour. It's a bit of both at times of being the new host. So everyone, please be nice to Nathan in the comments. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. And, yeah, so with that, um, Nathan, shall we... Yeah, well, well, I'll just try and get this out of the way. So, as you probably noticed, the team has changed up quite a lot. Um, some of the old team, they just can't make it. Martimer's got very pressing real-life stuff. Uh, I think if you're friends with Martimer on Facebook, you know what I mean. I think he's going to make a video about it at some point. But we shall quickly get on to introducing the uh, New Look team and welcoming... Jen, how are you doing? I'm not too bad, thank you very much. And welcome to the show, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. And probably a sort of familiar face, she's called in a few times before. Uh, Julia, how are you doing? Oh, great, how are you? Oh, we're doing grand. And I think, like I said, uh, also with the introduction, we'll just get a little bit uh, of information. So Nathan, give us, this is the old, give us a little bit of information about yourself to the audience, because... I think they always wonder why we're speaking on these subjects and what right we have to speak on them. So I think we'll go with you, Nathan, first and see your introduction. All right. Well, I went to college in Southern Oregon to study journalism as my major and philosophy as my minor. So I've got a good mix of uh, knowledge and background found on reporting on current events and things that are going on in the world, and also how to think logically and reasonably and critically. Uh, that's where philosophy comes in. That's my academic background, and uh, there's not much to say about me other than my academic background in terms of qualifications. And so how did you get into the whole skepticism thing? Uh, I read books uh, shortly uh, after I started college in my uh, freshman year, I read books by James Randi in particular, and, and uh, that got me interested in skepticism. Um, it uh, occurred to me that uh, there's not a lot of critical thinking in the media these days, and skepticism and critical thinking 
about the world is a good asset to have uh, for any journalist. And that's something I'm really passionate about is bringing a level of uh, a more rigorous level of accuracy to the discipline of journalism and Coffee. encouraging <laughs> Daily Mail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I'm very critical of uh, alternate media, which we're going to discuss on this show, I think. Yep. And uh, citizen journalists who are people who have no background in journalism, who are going around saying they're journalists, but in reality they're conspiracy theories, conspiracy theorists, yep. who um, brand themselves as uh, investigative reporters when they're not to lend themselves legitimacy. Yep. And I'm also very critical of the mantra that's taught in a lot of journalism schools today that um, there's no right or wrong answer to anything and everything's equal and yeah. the false the false balance problem that you see in a lot of media. All right, great. And Jen, here she is. It's a little soapbox moment now. All right, thank you. Um, well, I first got into skepticism probably because I've always been a, I've been a long-term skeptic of religion in general. Um, and from that, I also had a boyfriend who was into conspiracy theories. So I got to see firsthand the whole 9-11 truth movement, uh, anti-GMO, et cetera, et cetera, from my, from my ex who was constantly looking into this on a day-to-day -day basis and telling me the new conspiracy theories and, he was very much into it, and at one point I also bought into that kind of stuff before I actually had time to start looking into it properly. Um, and from that, of course, I saw a lot of people like Alex Jones and Mike Adams and various other people in that particular movement firsthand and got to understand the kind of rubbish that gets pushed on you, the kind of completely unskeptical rubbish that gets put, pushed onto you uh, through those particular movements and circles. Um, and that got me into skepticism itself and into joining a skeptics group, which then grew my interest in understanding things in a more rational, on a more rational basis. All right, cool. And Julia, time for your introduction. Right. Um, I have a biology degree. I recently, actually, just last month, got my uh, master's degree. So oh, cool. I'm happy about that. Um, how I got into skepticism is, well, so my uh, my parents are, are kind of hippies. They're, they've been a very, I've had a very um, kind of new age woo kind of thing growing up around me, uh, like I wasn't vaccinated as a child, things like that. Um, but I was always, I already always uh, was an atheist. I never really believed in a religion. So when I got on... Facebook, I joined a couple of um, atheist groups, yep. and through that, actually, I started to also question the, the New Age stuff, and also through my degree, started to learn about immunology and how vaccines work, things like that, um, so that I learned a lot that way, and I want to uh, bring, kind of, um, bring that further to other people as well. Sounds. So Nathan, you've, you're now officially the host, so take it away, you've got the agenda there. Yeah, uh, first on the agenda is Jack Chick, and Jack Chick is a notorious Christian cartoonist who died a week ago today, October 23rd. He was 92 years old, and he spent a huge portion of his life publishing um uh, small religious tracts known as Chick Tracks. Uh, they're everywhere. Most people are familiar with them. Most uh, atheists and skeptics, anyway, are familiar with them. And I'm just going to button here. My first experience was the, 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 the when I was very much here, when I was in, kind of, I don't know, well, when I was in school, basically, we got handed them by the teachers. Because uh, they would have evangelical ministers come to our classes sometimes to warn us of the evils of, and it was mostly Dungeons and Dragons at the time, and mm -hmm. still never played. But it was a lot of that, and there was some um, stuff about heavy metal music. I, I remember that as well. Cause yeah, 
Yeah, just to add another little anecdote, you've heard this when I know it, but this is when I got into serious trouble in school was he was giving us this long lecture and he went on about a, a teenage boy he knew that had killed themselves over an island maiden record. And then, uh, I think Jen might understand this, that, that was the, this was the time when Bruce Dickinson had left the band, so, uh, and I just instantly replied to well, the new stuff's not that bad, surely, but, yeah, needless to say, that wasn't the reaction he wanted to, the story was tragic suicide, so, yeah, I couldn't have seen it, but, yeah, I remember these really well. Jen, have you come across them? Uh, I haven't actually come across Jack Chick until recently, until we started talking about it the other day, so I've been trying to read up a little bit on it, and having... I think he's, I think, I think he's, uh, I think he's probably more well-known, and his tracks are more well-circulated in the U.S. than anywhere else. Yeah, or, yeah, so. or if in the U.K. you grew up in that particular religious community like I did. Um, Julia, have you had any experience with this? Uh, not until I started to uh, kind of be in an atheist community a little bit, so I, yeah. I kind of heard of it, but I it was just... never a big part of my life. Yeah, they're, um, well, they are quite interesting cartoons to read, because when you're a child, it's all if this is evil and you're going to burn in hell, and there's quite graphic depictions of hell and everything, it was kind of quite traumatizing for a lot of ch uh, people I've heard. That's kind of the main thing a lot of atheists have said. They grew up with it and they were scared. They couldn't sleep for, you know, nights afterwards. Yeah, like I mentioned in one of my posts, I uh, vividly remember reading my first chick track when I was eight or nine years old. And it was... Uh, from trick or treating on Halloween, uh, the people uh, whose house we went to would put the chick tracks in the in with the bag of candy. So that's how I uh, was first exposed to it, and I had nightmares for days afterwards. And now, as an adult, I look at them as really campy entertainment. <laughs> wow! When, when we were kids, we used to have garbage pail kids. <laughs> 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 We had that over here, but, uh, yeah, like I just said, I just, we just remember getting these handed out, and also in church as well. Excuse me. Carry on, guys, I'm going to have a coffee and fit, so I'm going to have to go off my for a second here. It's quite funny seeing some of the stories that have been written about this guy afterwards as well. Like, one of them is titled, Evangelical Cartoonist Jack Chick was a Dr. Seuss of Hayland. <laughs> Yeah, Dark Dungeons was a big one. Uh, Cal just mentioned um, Dungeons and Dragons being one of his uh, most hated and feared things that he went after. Um, and his his track Dark Dungeons is probably the one he's most famous for, and the one that atheists love the most because in it he, he depicts Dungeons and Dragons as the gateway game to occultism and Satanism. The characters, the characters uh, in the story, in the tract, uh, are D&D players. One of them does really well in the game, and the the dungeon master uh, approaches her and says, uh, "You've been selected to become a part of the coven, and uh, which is a secret society of witches that D&D uh, &D players who excel in the game are initiated into." And uh, then there's uh, uh, a character who kills herself because her character dies in the game. And wow. It's, it's crazy. crazy. He would have hated Stranger Things. Oh, yeah. Do you reckon, did he write anything about Stranger Things before he died? I wonder if he did. That'd be interesting. He was quiet the last few years. He wasn't he wasn't much coming from it. No. A lot of a lot of the more recent tracks in recent years have been ghostwritten by. His company, I don't think he uh, actually produced a lot of content in recent years. Yeah, who knows? They are, just, they are kind of a cultural oddity now, I think most folk view them as. Yeah. Because um, he did have some, I mean, people, a lot of people think they've just been sort of a bit eulogy saying he was a talented, he was an okay artist and he probably could have worked on some comic strips or something, but, you know, he made a fortune with these. Because there's like 750 million of them have been distributed or something, the record. 
It's like some ridiculous number. Yeah, plus he had a, his own publishing company and uh, all, several really fringe authors um, got published through his company. Yeah. Uh, people with really crazy out there ideas that are really on the fringe. And uh, he also had a, a run of comics that are not as well known as Chick Tracks, but uh, they're called the Crusaders comics. And um, they're, st- they'll, they're still in circulation. Um, issue 22 just came out, I believe. But uh, they tell a bit longer stories um, dealing with uh, fundamentalist paranoia ideas. Uh, my favorite is one called Spellbound, and that's also about uh, anti-rock and um, right. about, about witches who... Witches and warlocks who take uh, the master tapes from bands recording their music, and they uh, they bless them with demonic spirits, and so the demonic spirits ent- enter the master tapes, and uh, that's how they uh, um, that's how they uh, use mind control to control the masses. I don't think there's much more, yeah. I, more I can add to that, <laughs> really. It's just, <laughs> they are just, uh, it's a weird glimpse into the kind of evangelical minds, these uh, cartoons. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if he, really, if he believed all of it, um, given the, uh, also that he made so much money off of it, and if he believed it, where are where is he getting those ideas that those are the kind of things that really happen? Um, I think he did. I think he was sincere in his beliefs in all, of the, in all of these things. Otherwise, it's just for the sheer amount of time and the amount he did of them. Uh, it's kind of, like I said, it's always difficult to keep up an act so long and not slip at least once. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like people say, you know, about Mike Adams or Alec Jones. Do you think they're playing it? And I say, well, they would have at least kind of slipped up by now a little bit, you know. They, I think they all do genuinely believe what they're spouting, these guys. But it's guys who do... Yeah, and, and plus plus when people pretend like that, a lot of times um, they cave under pressure. Eventually they'll say stuff like, oh, I was just uh, playing a character, or yeah. it was just satire. Eventually they'll cave under uh, the, the public attention that they get that they don't necessarily want. Perhaps if they don't have the, the kind of support that they do. I mean, Alex Jones, for example, has got a massive amount of support that he's been drumming up for years and years and years. And he he full well knows that a lot of what he does is to sell his products. And I mean, he always sticks in the product advertisement on the end of what he does now, doesn't he? Yeah. Buy, mm-hmm. buy this new, this, that, and the other. So he's got a vested interest in keeping up appearances. So yeah. I don't know. I'm not 100% certain. I'm, I, I think a lot of these people might have started off believing what they believed and then kind of it doesn't matter anymore now because they're doing so well with it. Yeah, yeah. plus there's plus there's the uh, issue of uh, investment where they invest so much time and energy throughout their lives to some things that uh, they can't really – there's no going back. Yeah. They have to carry on. Yeah, and why not, I suppose? I mean, if you're rolling in the fucking Benjamins as a result of this, then uh... – <laughs> You're not going to care, are you? I mean, Alex Jones, I don't know what his net wealth is at the minute, but he, he's doing pretty well for himself. Oh, yeah. If his, yeah. If his rapid expansion is anything... Well, no, that's horrible silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Anyway, moving along, Nathan. Yeah, uh, next up in our agenda is the kangaroo court known as the Monsanto Tribunal oh, that's, that's currently is... going on. I think, in, you know, I think it is finished now. They delivered their verdict, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Oh, that's right. This was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, that happened October 14th, I believe. Yeah. And um, uh, their verdict is nothing surprising. We already know what their verdict was going to be before the tribunal ever started. Uh, because they um, were mainly interested in controlling the campaign and controlling uh, who attended the assembly and um, not allowing dissenting voices to enter into the conversation. Yeah. Well, 
um, I think someone actually put it like this, kind of how, you know, Mike Adams and then they think they put on a lab coat and they're a scientist. Well, this is, these people rent a room out in The Hague and they think they're a legal court suddenly. I yeah, mean, that's uh, pretty they, much what's happened here. They invested £500,000 into uh, erecting this tribunal, which isn't recognized by uh, the international organization that oversees these kinds of trials, even though they, they claim that they're under the auspices of... Uh, I can't remember the name of the international organization uh, that they're claiming. Yeah, um, I, I, think, I, I, know, I think I know who you're on about. Um, uh, it slipped my mind as well. But I, I think we can bring in Julia. You've got some words about this tribunal as well. Um, Julia? Yeah, there you are. Yeah. Um... Uh, not a whole lot. I just um, I looked up a couple of articles yesterday to kind of prepare, but it's it sounds like they're basically, um, yeah. I think the article I read they said that they were um, so they took the the guidelines from the court um, from the the Hague court and from the, the UN and say okay we're going to go by these guidelines and kind of now we're a real court or something. That's basically it. Um, yeah, and no. we're in the Hague, so we're legit as anything, you know. Right, the Hague is the... Uh, that makes everything right. Yeah, it, it's pretty much what they've gone for. And there's also the story this week, there was a pro-GMO scientist who registered to give evidence, but they struck him off. Well, he blocked mm -hmm. him completely. Was he forcibly removed from it? I can't remember. He was. He was forcibly removed because he he showed up even though his registration was cancelled. And uh, that was David Zarek, who writes for Risklunger dot com, a really yeah. excellent uh, website. And uh, he's a a pro GMO and pro agritech science communicator, who's done a lot of work to uh, promote uh, biotech. Uh, technology, and uh, it didn't take long for um, the tribunal to uh, kick him off the registry. Uh, I think he said in his article that they sent him the email the night before the event happened that they had knocked him off. Yeah, Did they plus... give him a reason for it all? Uh, they thought that he was going to be disruptive of the proceedings, I think is the reason they gave. Well, but the real reason of... As in he wasn't going to agree with them. Yeah. yeah. Plus, like, the main thing is, if you're holding Monsanto on trial, you would think they would actually have people from Monsanto on the trial. But they didn't. Yeah, there was absolutely was, nobody yeah. there. No, Monsanto, Monsanto was declined. Defended. They declined to be there. Okay. Well, they offer. They, uh, did they just think it was a waste of time? Well, obviously, it's going to be a waste of their time. I think there was a, I had a statement, or a part of a statement from Monsanto. Here. Mm. And plus, given what anti-GMO activists, so I think they would be worried about their safety going to something like this. I mean, mm. I know, I know kind of Vance has told us he's never had any issues with that, but you know, this is really the fringe extremists of the anti-GMO crowd act that uh, got all this together. Mm -hmm. And I think, was it, was it Vandana Shiva? She was the main mover behind us. Yeah, she was part of the organization, I think. Yeah. And, like, mm -hmm. she's someone i got really... She's another... And she's one I actually struggle to think that she actually believes. Like I were talking about, do these folk believe what they're doing? And I think it's... Her act is so transparent at times, I think, with her, you know, playing the spiritual, kind of earthly, you know, warm and fuzzy, kind of uh, in old Indian woman that's wise in the Eastern ways and that. It just, it seems so put on for me, that. Yeah, she appears in uh, just about every anti-GMO documentary that comes out. Yeah. Is that, um... Miles Power, who called her like the uh, the Nicholas Cage of the anti-GMO activists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's basically yeah. It. 
It's quite strange because I said um, a few weeks ago there was a film festival on here in my town and one of the films we were going to show is a thing called Seed and it's bankrolled by Vandana Shiva. I was desperate to go to it. I went along on the night because they said someone from the film was going to be there to answer questions and I'd, you know, I PM'd loads of my pro-GMO friends to have stuff ready and then the last minute there was a licensing issue and I was just so gutted but the claims on the flyer were that 98% of all the seed varieties have gone extinct now or something. <coughs> I don't know if you've heard this one, Julia, have you? Uh, is that film? Uh, no, just this claim. I think they say like 90% of natural seed varieties have now gone extinct and it's only so many and it's all kind of oh. farm crops. No, I've not heard that one. How, that makes no sense. Yeah, it's yeah. almost surely an exaggeration. See if I can find the claim right now. But yeah, the whole Monsanto trial was just from the outset when I heard it described to me. I just knew, yeah, this <laughs> this isn't what they think it's going to be. I got that email here from the um, uh, let's see, from when uh, David Zeruf was disinvited here. Yeah. It says. The aim of the People's Assembly is to discuss alternatives to industrial agriculture, and we don't think you share that aim. We also notice on your blog that you aim to disturb the program. It's funny how they use uh, language like that when what they what they really mean is uh, you're going to disagree with us. Uh, they use you phrases like you're going, card, you know. they use phrases like you're going to disrupt the. The proceedings, and you're going to be uh, a nuisance, and you're going to uh, be loud or obnoxious. Or... Yeah, it's a very typical kind of conspiracy theorist um, comeback, which is what we get on Flat Earth chat all the time. I mean, when we talk to Flat Earthers, generally, if you get irritated with them, or if in any way you speak to them in which they deem that to be rude, or they, they feel like they're being put in a corner, They'll turn around and say, well, I wouldn't speak to you like that. You're being rude to me, that kind of thing. So they take offense to the way that you conduct yourself with them and use that as an argument against you. It's, it's a bizarre type of that dominant attack um, to try and discredit you as an individual because of the way you choose to actually converse with them, because of your getting irritated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here it is. I found a claim. They say 94% of our seed varieties have disappeared in the last... Century. Yeah, they don't talk about how many new ones have been created either, do they? I mean, so, yeah. yeah. Or and then there's there's of course the Svalbard sea, sea vault that they bring into it as well, saying this is the uh, the doomsday vault, and that is because Monsanto are getting rid of all the all the biodiversity, um, and therefore they've got that as a backup, so that when they've killed everyone off with one single crop failure as a result <laughs> of this. This biovirus that they're going to release to destroy all the food in the world and bring down the population to, what is it, six million people? I can't remember what the... What this oh, I can't really, I, there's various it's figures in this depopulation story here that they're yeah. trying to reduce the, and the yeah, population. The, the Georgia Guidestones that the conspiracy theorists are always uh, whinging on about, uh, I think it, it says uh, bring the population down to one million. Oh, I think it's a billion, is it not? Oh, oh, is it a billion? Yeah, I think that, that rings a bell. But I think that was... Was that just someone saying that is what... That's kind of the capacity, like, just for the natural resources to sustain a, a population for a long time or something? Yeah, and plus, I think those guide stones were erected by somebody who... Um, just... Uh, it was a, a wealthy patron of uh, the state who just wanted to put up something provocative. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the, uh, what is the event that Alex Jones has always been going on about where the wealthy elites uh, go into the grove, the Bohemian Grove? Right. Uh, yes. He makes a big deal about that when in reality it's just a, a big group of wealthy people who uh, go into the woods and have a party, basically. It's the way they enjoy themselves, and it's, it shows the lack of being able to sympathize with what people in a higher economic class do for fun. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, 
yeah, it's like um, someone's pointed out to me there that, you know, Monsanto actually do hire biologists and kind of biologists do sort of know that you need biodiversity. It's kind of a good thing to have. Yeah, it's kind of part of the degree there. Yeah, it's kind of vital for any biology to take place, diversity. There was another claim that was um, even more extreme in the doc in the the trailer for the documentary scene, where they said that Monsanto would come in the night to spray chemicals, oh, yeah. and the next morning their children woke up and their pillows were bloody. Oh and yeah, was, yeah, that's why I was saying I was looking forward to because that's a brand new claim. And I think, like, even um, some of the guys I spoke, like I said, we're still quite friendly with some of the Monsanto guys we've interviewed previously, and they were actually quite curious. They well, this is brand new. We've got to know what this is. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of, they just, they're actually quite, they say, some of the claims we hear about us are just, say, my, I wish we could do some of the, you know, some of this stuff is so far out there. So it'd be actually fairly impressive if we could pull off some of this stuff that's claimed about us. The production values in the Z documentary, based on what is in the trailer, they look pretty good. So I was surprised to find such fringy stuff in it. Like I can yeah. understand if they if they use misleading numbers like the 98% uh, C diversity loss, but it's to throw that 94%. I don't know where this is. This is a brand new claim, and I haven't heard this anywhere else. That's a new one. So uh, I'd be very keen to know how they've come up with this. Because I've tried searching, searching, but there's no real all the sources lead back to the documentary, so... Yeah, it probably originates with the documentary. No idea where they would get an idea like that. Uh, and I think it's, it's like some gross oversimplification of some figures. It's probably a new uh, um, urban legend that's cropping up, the idea of Monsanto coming in the middle of the night, because it did feature prominently in the movie Consumed. Uh, was the the old farmer was it Morgan Freeman in that uh, movie? Danny Glover, yeah. Danny Glover, that's right. Danny Glover, the the old farmer, oppressed, wakes up in the middle of the night, and uh, the GMO goons are harassing him, driving around his farm in the middle, middle of the night. Yeah. So that's starting to come up as a pop culture trope in the anti-GMO movement. That film has been very powerful as well, which I've spoken to a few people about and I've showed to a few people. It's um, The World According to Monsanto, which oh, is one yeah. in which... It's a very, very one-sided story. It's very much anti-Monsanto. It's, it's not really any kind of... The main thing that came out when I saw that movie was actually just... Um, I was amazed this woman could make a movie about her sitting at a computer screen. <laughs> That's the bulk of this. It's kind of um, like I think it's when I was looking up things about the making of the Spotlight movie, and there was interviews with the journalists. I said, "How on earth they can make a film about our job? We don't know. Our job is just not film material." And then cause they said, "Oh, it's just us just sitting at the computers all day." And this is what this woman's done. She's made a film out of her sitting at a computer for two hours. I haven't seen that particular film. If you ever wanted to see journalism, the kind of real-life movie that it is. Well, The World According to Monsanto is more about one where they, uh, they're they going around uh, farms in America and also in India, is it, as well, talking about the pesticide and Roundup and oh, the yeah. fact that Monsanto made Agent Orange, therefore they must be bad, and various other bits and pieces. It's, I mean, it's quite convincing if you don't look at it with a sceptical mind, yeah. especially because of its the completely one-sided nature. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the problem. I mean, that's the problem with the most prominent and the most highly rated online um, uh, documentaries about Monsanto are this type. They are the demonization. There's very little out there with a voice on both sides. Yeah. But, um, yeah, GMO, OMG, takes some beating just for some of the scenes. In it. I've actually watched it now, Nathan. Oh, good. And I kind of picked yeah. up on... Because there's that part where he actually tries to go into the Monsanto offices and they tell him, uh, no... Uh, so, so that is that is my favorite scene in the whole movie. Yeah. So just as a backer, he he just tries to walk into the off the uh, Monsanto HQ and they're just like, 
who are you? Why are you here? Uh, no, you can't come in. You're not a guest. Go away. Which is just what would happen if you tried to walk into anyone's place of work, just unannounced. Yep, and then he goes back to his car and said, they're hiding something. They're not letting me in. Wow. And the other part, uh, like uh, Nathan, that I picked up on was you can see his his wife is kind of getting visibly pissed off with him all the time. Mm-hmm. Saying, yeah. yeah but, that, but, scene, that scene where they're at the roadside diner and... Yeah. He's yeah, gesturing you, her about the food she's ordering. Yeah, and her body language is, uh, just stop with this filming shit. You've actually got a family here to look after as well. Yeah, do you recall the part near the end when he actually, in his narration, he actually said that his wife and kids were uh, becoming upset with him more and more? And, yeah, uh, he I had wonder that, why. He had, he had that scene where uh, he filmed his... Uh, two little kids looking out the window at the ice cream truck, and they had these sad faces because he wouldn't let them get their ice cream. <laughs> put that in there. Yeah. yeah, he put that in there. And uh, what's hilarious is um, he's not that great of an editor, so there are there's some raw data or raw data. There's some raw footage in there that gets left in the film, and that actually has unintentionally hilarious effects on yeah. skeptical viewers, at least. Like the scene where he's talking to his kids about ice cream. And he said, do you know that there's really bad stuff in the ice cream that you're eating? And his kids are just munching down on it. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> and, uh, oh, it can, it can hurt you uh, years later when you're an adult. Oh. And he's like, are you concerned about that? And his kids are like, nope. Nom, 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 nom. Because <laughs> they're kids with ice cream. Yeah. They're not going to be the most objective uh, people on the views of on, about ice cream, are they? No. But it is, like I said, that's the kind of highlight for me, is just you can see his wife getting visibly pissed off with him all the time. Like, if, yeah. there wasn't, if there wasn't a separate, uh, kind of separation after that film, I'd, I'd be very surprised. Because you can see her getting more and more just kind of give it a rest now. This is this is getting a bit weird for me. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, I need to finish my series on that. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think it is one I think for um, this kind of psychologist and that just to analyse the body language and between his family and him through the film. Yeah. Alright, so I think we can carry on. I think this is our last topic. It's, it's going to be a little bit of a shorter show this time just because we're Kind of get back into the swing of things. So we've got one last topic to go on. Yeah, our last topic we're going to tackle is the alternative media. Yeah, um, and yeah, uh, I think you're going to say what I. But uh, before you watch this, go and watch. I know some people hate this guy, but he is a guy. He's a great writer and he's a provocateur and all that. But that's Maddox, and go and watch his video about this beforehand. He does. Sometimes I think he's completely wrong on things, but some. But he does. He is just. Uh, you can't take your eyes off his articles and his videos when he does that. Mm-hmm. You, you should put a link to that in the description. Yeah, um, I definitely will do. Because yeah, I know he's. Yeah, so, no, it's just like I'm saying. He does upset people at times, but he is very worth. You know, he's someone that kind of gets your attention regardless. Mm-hmm. And what he says in this particular video, which is the only. Uh, video of his I've seen uh, is pretty much spot on. Um, he talks about uh, the idiocy of uh, the alternative media, on, uh, especially online. Um, he goes after Infowars, uh, yeah. things like TruthPlanet.tv is that the name of the website? And uh, in his in the article version, uh, he talks yeah. about the keywords that pop up in the URLs. Well, the the main point which he made, which he, he addressed in a way I never thought of, was, you know, the you're fans of alt media, and you've probably we've all got friends on Facebook that say this that you know the the mainstream media or what they call the lamestream is controlled by corporations. Mm-hmm. But as he puts it, because well, you know they. And that kind of actually puts pressure on reporters to be good at their job, because if they don't do it right, they'll lose their funding. I mean, and yeah, there yeah. is sometimes, but they, it always seems to get called out when journalists uh, aren't 
you know, don't use their integrity. Yeah, all the time, and the alt media crowd, the people who write for alt media, don't get called out on anything they put out. Yeah, and they are free to just put out anything they feel like. Yes, and Maddox also pointed out that uh, they are also funded by corporations, many of them. Because, in a weird way, because most of them are corporations themselves. Yeah. Um, like, Infowars is a copyrighted brand, I believe. Yes. And yeah, well, kind of, that, and that's the irony of it. That the, he gets so many millions, and that he is basically a corporation on his own. But I say, like, he never gets fact checked. He doesn't have to worry about, you know, press standards or anything like that. What do you think of people who started off on websites like Infowars and then sort of built up their own little empires like um, Paul Joseph Watson, PrisonPlanet.tv? And I, I remember him first starting off with Alex Jones, or that's how it seemed anyway back well, in the day. Well, my opinion of him is... I, I can't see the appeal of that guy. Alex Jones, I said he's one of these guys, regardless, he's he's an entertaining watch. Yeah, he's got he has a... He has the charisma yeah. and he knows how to sell himself, whereas that Paul Joseph Watson, I just cannot stomach watching that guy at all. He does not there's, a lot of people say, there's a lot of people who kind of say, well, I don't like Alex Jones, but I like Paul Joseph Watson because yeah. Paul Joseph I, Watson I don't know, that's talks truth fair. about this, that and the other, and he's, you know, he talks truth about this. It's the usual sort of truth type of yeah. thing. They, oh. um, they give him more credibility than Alex Jones because they find Alex Jones too exuberant, they find him too... Um, and I wonder if this is kind of, you probably, and Julia, this kind of uh, English accent bias. Oh, yeah. the um, uh, If you have an English accent, then you are more trust. likely to lend more weight to what they're saying. Yeah, you're immediately more intellectual and all this kind of stuff. I don't know, Julia, did you come across that at all? Um, I haven't heard of that before, actually. It's not really a phenomenon as such, it's just something I think you tend to get in America at times. That, uh, you know, you can put out some really bad information in America, but if you get an English accent behind it, it somehow sounds more credible. I can, I can see how that might be perceived that way. Yeah, like, so, uh, that, I mean, that's the Paul Joseph Watson thing. I think that's, because I think for him, his, I mean, for all the enforced, it is America that's the main market for that stuff. He does, I mean, I, he does seem less crazy, but I don't know. Um, I've only seen a handful of videos of his. So to me, it, uh, from what I've seen of videos of his, it seems like a kind of broken clock is right twice a day kind of thing. Yeah. And, yeah, because he did start off with Alec Jones, didn't he? That's how I remember it. Yeah, he was kind of part of Infowars, and now he's... I think he still does stuff for Infowars, but he's kind of doing his own thing as well. So in Mike Adams and various other people who have been very much um, increased in popularity through appearing on Alex Jones' show. Um, well, well like I, said, I think we've said this before, but out of all of them, Mike Adams is just the most insane of the lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you read his blog posts and it actually it gets disturbing at times, the things he's writing. I think you're, you're agreeing with me there, Nathan. Oh, yeah, definitely. He's, he's got the uh, kind of sex appeal vote for a lot of um, people as well. I mean, he's, he's always been quite a good-looking chap, hasn't he, Mike Adams? And I think that raises his psychopath level a I little know. bit. Yeah, and like I say, it is just because um, it's not really posts or editorials, just they're rants and they're just these kind of trains of thought and it's kind of... It's really disturbing the things he just puts. He just, you can tell he's just putting what is, what's in his mind. He's not filtering it in any way. Yeah, and that's why that um, from day to day you'll see him say one thing, and then the next day or two days later he'll say something that contradicts what he said in an earlier article. Yeah. Uh, like I say, but like I say, the thing with Alex Jones is he is genuine. He's got that charisma and appeal to a lot of folk. That people just say, oh, he's just passionate and all that. I mean, and he is. He is though. Yeah, he really does come across as very passionate. Yeah, so does David Icke as well, though. I mean, he's still got a lot of followers, despite some of the ridiculously crazy things he said. Well, I have. 
you know, David Dyke, we talked about the English accent phenomenon. I have actually seen someone actually admit that that's why they like David Dyke, and that's why they <laughs> think he's trustworthy. And it was a Polish guy I knew, and he was, my Polish mate, he studied, he was very much into, you know, speaking methods. That was kind of his area of studying when he did English at school. And he was just convinced by David Dyke, he speaks well, and oh, it's so convincing the way he comes across on that. And he was, he genuinely believed And then when I told him about do you know this stuff that David Icke believes? No, he can't believe that. And then he looked it up and he said, holy shit, it's unreal. But that's yeah, reptilians only scratches the surface of... I mean, everyone talks about David Icke's reptilian ideas about the reptilians uh, controlling society, but that only scratches the surface of the crazy of David Icke. Uh, you get a David Icke book and just read through it and you can be entertained for hours from all the crazy that's packed in these huge books he writes with small print. It's uh, actually, I think it takes a lot of talent to come up with the, the kind of bullshit he comes up with. A lot of drugs. A lot of drugs. I mean, he always yeah. talks about the fact that he's, you know, he's spoken, he's spoken to ancient dead spirits and all that kind of stuff, and they've told him about this and the other. And there, there is a lot of drug use involved. And, and the, I, I went to QED recently, and it's interesting because we, we had Suzanne uh, Blackmore there this year. Oh, she's right. one of the She's not the premier skeptics over here, I don't know. Well, most, most skeptics. Yeah, I know the name. I've tried to actually have her on the show before, but she doesn't. You know, she just says she doesn't do podcast interviews. So well, she... that's good. Yeah, but I mean, she was, she was talking about her experiences of drugs and the fact that if you go into it with a skeptical mind and you understand that it's a, an interesting psychological and, you know, a physiological thing that you can experience and you, as long as you've got the right mindset, you come out of it saying, oh, that was amazing. These drugs are fucking brilliant. But, you know, I understand that this is all in my head. If you don't go into it with that mindset and you, you start to believe the kind of things that you experience are real, you come out of it with a mindset like David Icke or certain other people within the so-called truth movement who believe that, for example, Nibiru is real or that the earth is flat. Or that Lord Stephen Christ is the second coming of Jesus. Do you think uh, drugs uh, of any kind, hallucinogenic or um, what have you, plays any role in Jordan's content, spirit science? Oh, definitely. I wouldn't be surprised. Yes. I wouldn't be surprised. It's on that kind of doubt. But saying that, there are some people who have that kind of a mindset without the need for drugs as well, which is oh, yeah. interesting in itself. I find that fascinating. Um, that there, there are people with a predisposition to it. And I wonder if that's because they're a product of somebody, um, one of their parents, their mum or their dad, having been on drugs when they were born or something. I don't know. This is just me flying off the handle and making hypotheses on, on, on the back of that. But yeah, it's an interesting neurotype, regardless of what the cause is, I think. I was going to ask her, Julia, you said you came from a kind of hippie background. Uh, do any of your family or relatives still, are they into spirit science, do you know? I, I don't know if that's too personal to ask well, or not. My, um, so I'm from the Netherlands. My parents don't, don't really watch a lot of English stuff, so they probably right. wouldn't have come across it. Um, but, you know, there's, there's there's all kinds of alternative uh, medicine, quote-unquote, people. And, um, yeah, my grandma wanted a pyramid for under her bed. <laughs> I don't want to yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting enough, like the sorry, I'm, the first time I kind of came across the spiritualist crowd was I went to uh, it was a close relative of mine. She had breast cancer. We went along to this breast cancer support conference, and I was stunned at the amount of woo that was on display there. It was really kind of quite unnerving. The breast cancer support. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was like a kind of conference just for, you know, all the support groups in Scotland. They yeah. got together in this hotel and, you know, just, you know, there's workshops and, all, you know, just like any other kind of conference. But it was just amazing how there was, like, stuff like chakras and medita meditation. Those are, the, those are the kinds of places that uh, woo peddlers thrive, is when there's an illness or a disease that somebody's or, going through. Or it's uh, caused a trauma on them or something like that. Yeah, they exploit that. And they they go after the emotions, and yeah. when people are the most vulnerable. Okay, yeah, that's really bothersome that there's so many of that, and then in a conference like that, I'm, I was not aware that 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 happened, and it, it 
a breast cancer awareness conference? That's crazy. Yeah, it was. It was, it was, uh, it was some psych, I don't know, psychic healers, but there was definitely chakras and all that kind of stuff going on. And it was the first time I'd ever come face to face with people like that. Was just, and, you know, this is while I was, this is kind of, wasn't that long ago, and I was a full on skeptic at the time, was, you know, I just, should I say something? I just said, no, 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 I'm not. It's just, it won't go down well if I start it here, so. To kind of bring this back to alternative media, yep. alternative alternative medicine is kind of the parallel to alternative media, yep. where they're skeptical of uh, conventional medicine and um, yep. not realizing that uh, medicine that works is by definition conventional. There's no such thing as alternative versus conventional. It's a false... Uh, It's a false dichotomy. I don't know if I'm using the right word there. But um, to be skeptical of the mainstream media because they're mainstream makes no sense. Because um, what is media that um, accurately reports what's really going on? It's just uh, the media. And um, if you want an alternative to that, that would seem to imply that uh, you don't want um, accuracy uh, in, in the same way that the mainstream uh, venues are uh, promoting. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's a kind, of, a kind of main claim of all the media. It's just, you know, you say they're controlled by the corporations, we are it, but, you know, it's mad, it's quite a well pointed out, it's corporate, corporate control can sometimes be actually quite a good thing because so much is on the line. You've got to get it right. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of media in in the U.S. anyway is to me a, quite disappointing. So yeah, I know how I, I don't know how it is in the U.K. But in what I'm used to in the Netherlands, when you have a news show or just it's not a show, it's news. You know, they don't give any opinions. All they say is this and this happened this and this person uh, said this, that person said that. Um, there is no opinions. If, if, and if there might be a show after the news where they actually bring someone in who might have an opinion, and even then the journalists themselves don't have an opinion. Yeah. Um, so that's very disappointing in American news. So I understand that, that pushback, but alternative media is just not the solution to that. Um, yeah, what, what I'm, I guess what I was trying to get at is what uh, what is the missing component that alternative media practitioners are looking for where they want to call their work alternative. Um, so uh, they're skeptical of mainstream media, but a lot of times they're, um, they can't articulate why they're skeptical of it other than to use the word mainstream as an epithet or yeah. um, as a bad word. Yeah. Mainstream media isn't bad because it's mainstream. There are issues with it because they're not being entirely objective. Right. They're they're critical of mainstream media for all the wrong reasons, and what they're putting out is even worse. A lot of the time, yeah. Yeah, because there's no there's no objectivity in alternative media. Most of the time, it is very much demonizing whichever is their their most fashionable. Uh, target for that particular day, for that particular week, for that particular year. Well, they've got their overall fashionable targets, such as Monsanto, such as general media. I mean, there's a lot of hit pieces on on normal media or on police. Uh, any kind of law enforcement is a is a common target. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's it's very one-sided. There's no objectivity really. There's if they do. Um, interview anybody who's actually got a voice that is against theirs, they will characterize it, they will, um, they will uh, use the occasional little uh, quote mine from them, but not actually put it in context. So, yeah, it's, it's just generally crap. I can't really put it in one I would say that we've got sort of a weird problem in the UK, like... Um if you're aware, we, could, we have non-impartiality if you're going to be a broadcast news service here. You're not allowed to show any bias. Um, 
and you know, at first I don't think that sounds great, but then like I remember, you know, if you're doing a story on homeopathy, you have to have a homeopath on the show, and you have to have a mm-hmm. doctor. And so yeah. sometimes you get the situation where it's a doctor, he's maybe not used to being on TV, and he can come across poorly. Yeah, so yeah. That's kind of the that's one of the downsides of our media here, and <laughs> that's kind of where Simon Singh you kind of ran into problems with that as well. Because I think uh, he, he criticised all med and they tried to get him done for slander over it, but he eventually got it cleared. But yeah, so that's the problem we have over here. Because that was the shocking thing when I finally got around to watching American media, was just the bias is just not hidden at all that's in some of the mainstream <laughs> yeah. reporting. Like, um, which is kind of quite good in a way, because then the journalists can sort of, you can see their feelings, but then I don't think there's one ideal solution to it. Yeah, uh, we had uh, Sean Otto on the show a few months ago, yeah. I think back in May, and he was yeah. talking about the problem of false balance and yeah. the problem of bias largely being a... a, a he talked about um, the repeal of the Fairness Doctrine in yeah. the 1980s, and where uh, the Fairness Doctrine was a regulation of the FCC that any content that went on the news, uh, whether I think it, it specifically related to broadcast news rather than print media, but it had to be covered and treated in a manner that the FCC deemed equitable and honest and uh, balanced, not balanced in the way uh, the term is used now, but just weighing, weighing the scales and devoting the weight of the discussion to the best evidence uh, side of, of the story. And uh, when that was repealed, that uh, and there was no more regulation for that, that opened the door for a lot of personalities to come on the scene, like Alex Jones and Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and all these guys, yeah. to say whatever they want uh, without any uh, pushback from yeah. any regulatory committee. And that, in turn paved the way for a lot of the uh, alternative media we see today, like Natural News and Infowars. Okay, I think, uh, we can, I think we can round it up there. This actually went on a lot longer than I thought it would. So. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, things that, I think it's working out quite well. Um, like I say, uh, <coughs> excuse me again, I'm struggling with a cold here, so if there's any coughing come through on the recording, I'm sincerely apologize for it but um thanks everyone for tuning in um i said i might i said i'll be in and out of the show a lot it's in the hands of nathan now um i think we've i've mentioned i've put a few ideas your way for future shows nathan and i think you've got some of your own as well don't you yeah yeah all right and uh, uh, i think i think the more ideas we get from everybody the better yeah, so leave ideas if there's any subjects you want us to talk about, any films you want us to see, or anything like that. Excuse me. Any suggestions for anything at all regarding the show, or improvements in it? Oh, jeez. Apart from good cough medicine for me. <laughs> Excuse me, this is just... Um, I wanna, <coughs> you can start to wrap up now, I'm going to go and have a cough fit again, so be back in a second. Alright, well, I guess I'll wrap it up and say I hope you enjoy the rebirth of Trolling with Logic. Hopefully it'll be a rebirth that lasts for a sufficient amount of time. Forever. Forever. I hope it, I hope it lasts forever. I hope we get more than a few shows before we die again. I hope we don't die again. Um, so, um, it's goodbye for me. Um, Everybody else can do their farewells, I guess, in their own way. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Goodbye. Bye. I, yeah, I'm, I'm really awkward at this. <laughs> signing, signing, signing in and signing out. I'll get more yeah. smooth out of it. I'll come up with a... No.
I've got eyes that I can't see. Forest for the trees. And I won't believe it till I see it on TV. I've got ears they don't hear. Words don't come in clear. So I'll sit back and watch it all just disappear. TV.